Hey guys, welcome back to Ken Michaels Radio, where I'm having so much fun talking about the Beatles and inviting lots of uh, great guests onto my show. I'm very excited about this particular show because with my background in radio, I like to invite people on that I've had a past with and reunite with them. And that certainly is the case with my special guest this time. It's JC Hayes. And uh, before I introduce you to him, uh, if you're a fan of the podcast show, Things We Said Today, which I do with Darren DeVivo of WFUV and also Alan Cozen, you might recall Darren has talked about how he first met me. And he seemed to recall that it was at a radio station that I worked at with JC, WZFM, which was in Westchester County um, in uh, White Plains. And it was 107.1 FM an adult contemporary station. I worked there in 1984 and 85. I did an overnight shift, Sunday overnight into Monday morning, 12 to six. And I gotta tell you folks, I loved doing that shift. I really did. JC was the program director. It was so much fun working with him then. He's now doing, he has been doing a Beatles program which is in syndication called Beatles Weekly. We'll talk about that. He wants to do a Fab Five show, but. JC Hayes, welcome to Ken Michaels Radio. I just want to say hi, boss. <laughs> <laughs> that that ended a long time ago, Ken. Uh -huh. My gosh, it's been too long, man. I mean, we should have done this a long time ago. Sure. Well, with Zoom, we could do this anytime. But let me, you know, you mentioned that you know the WZFM days back in the in in the eighties, um, and I had actually been there for a few years before that. Right. Uh, I, I actually started working there when it was still WRNW, and that was after interning for Howard Stern in 1978 as wow. my final year of college at uh, New York Tech, where you also went, right? Yeah. So, so did we not? Did we not connect at WNYT, New York Tech? No. Or were no. you? I was at New York Tech from 1979 through 82. And I really didn't get involved with the radio station until like 81. Okay. I'm glad you said that because I'm thinking, I don't remember Ken from college. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the memory is actually not too bad on this one. But that's uh, funny. You know, there's, there's so many connections that we have in radio. WRNW, which is where Howard Stern used to, he was a program director there. Yeah. They were a progressive rock station. Then. Yeah. Okay. So that must've been a blast working for him, but, also at the station was someone that I didn't know until I worked at WDHA used to work there. And that was Curtis K. Curtis K was doing mornings when I was interning. Yeah. Great guy. Yeah. He's one of my yeah. favorite people in radio. He, he was terrific. And before that, I mean, when I got there, she was gone, but of course, Meg Griffin, yep. who is a huge Beatle maniac uh, mm -hmm. uh, and is you know on Sirius XM. And I still love Meg. I used to listen to her when I was in college Right. Uh, you know, when I was a baby wannabe DJ, uh, still have the utmost respect for Meg uh, and Howard, too. I mean, look at what he's done, for God's sakes. Sure. I don't know why. Did, why didn't I ride those coattails a little longer? <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you know, funny thing is, Howard helped me get my first job in radio. Wow. He, he had a he had a pal who was a program director at a little AM station up in Rockland County, New York, WGRC. Okay. The guy's name was Al Citarella. And I think um, I think Howard went to college with him. So, you know, he kind of knew him. And mind you, at this time, Howard was not a superstar. Howard was working at R&W, a little, a little house in Briarcliff Manor, New York. Um, so he, he reached out to Al and said, hey, I got this guy who's uh, just graduating college. Um, you know, he's pretty fun and he's a good guy. Check him out. I called Al Citarella. He called me. Um, uh, he called me back, and then we met, and he hired me. And before I knew it, I was doing full time at my first radio gig. Thanks, Howard. Yeah. No, I've heard from so many people that Howard Stern is like deep down, he's a really nice guy. You know, the the persona that he's had on the radio doesn't always match. You know what he's like behind the scenes. He's really easy to get along with. He is. He's a pisser. He's a pitcher. I'd love to love to reconnect with him, you know, one day. So yeah, we had we had fun at WZFM. And then, you know, after that, I went up to Albany and did some work there. And 
I came back down to the New York Metro and worked in Stanford, Norwalk, Connecticut for a while mm. in radio there. I had an oldie station there, of course, tons of Beatles. Um, Beatles always tested well on those oldie stations. I mean, you mm. could never play enough Beatles. And that's what kind of, um, you know, being a lifelong Beatles fan, that's what kind of got me into the you know, the mindset of creating my own Beatles show, but so many other people did it. I said, ah, why should I do it? Mm. You know, so I didn't really come around to it till I'm going to say recently. Right. right. Um, with the show Beatles Weekly that I do now. Um, I guess I've been doing it for eight years. That's still, you know, that's, that's, that's a long time. A lot of people don't know. It's one thing to be a fan. It's another thing to be committed to delivering a show every single week it's a lot of work and it is a lot of work and and i i kind of i kind of cheat ken um i i cheat because my show is mostly music and i know the stuff that you do you do a lot of talk so you probably do a lot more legwork than i do producing a show don't get me wrong i have to put time in right every week because the show is called beatles weekly so i want to uh, make sure that I'm covering stuff that happened this week in Beatles history. Okay. So I'm, you know, always updating the database, making sure I know what happened this week in, you know, 68, what happened this week in, in solo Beatles, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, you know, we do a little Beatles news segment that I do. Um, so it encompasses everything Beatles and, you know, the folks love it. The listeners love it. So every show is really taking a look back at this week in Beatle history through the decade. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's other stuff, too, that I'll throw in. I mean, I'll do an occasional special here and there uh, where there really isn't a lot of history for that particular week. And there are some weeks where there isn't a lot of history. You know that. Mm. Um, but gosh, when you look back at the archives, there's, I'd say out of 52 weeks of the year, there's probably 40, 40 weeks with lots of good stuff, especially with the solo Beatles. Mm -hmm. You know, I find myself more and more saying, wow, there's, Look at all this stuff. And half of it is Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it, you know? I mean, and, um, just... you know, when, when people say to me, don't you get bored doing Beatles shows? Well, I tell them, well, not if you include the solo music. I mean, what they did as a band is the greatest catalog of all time to most people. But if you include all the solo stuff, you're going from 12, 13 albums to over 100, you know? Yeah not even counting the standalone singles that weren't on albums. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's insane. And there's, and the Beatles catalog itself is just, you know, come on. We love, we love the Beatles. It's why I do the show. I, I don't do the show to make money. I don't make any money on my show. So if anybody wants to reach in the wallet and send a little uh, tip uh, for me to play, it's all too much. I can do that. Um, <laughs> But, but uh, no begging, really. I, I just love doing the show. My wife is pissed at me for doing the show. Um, has been pissed for eight years. Why are you doing a show? You're not making any money. You're spending all the time in the studio. That's because I love what I do. I love the Beatles. And um, we need to keep their music alive. Um, and you can see it. You can see it with the, with the kids. Get on TikTok. Mm. There's, there's, and you know, you, you just spoke to a woman on TikTok who's, how old is she, 20? Early 20s. Yeah. Tyler Moody. Yep. She's fabulous. Mm -hmm. There are, there are young people, guys and girls who are just huge Beatle fans and they're continuing, you know, just letting everybody know how terrific the Beatles were and um, sometimes teaching me some things. I, I, you know what? I don't consider myself a Beatles expert, Ken. I'm not because... The more you know, the more you know, you don't know. That's right. You know, I know, yes. Harrison said, the more I learn, the less I know. Absolutely. And, it's, and, and it's, it's, it's just mind boggling. Uh, now, do I know more about the Beatles than the average person? Absolutely. Do I know more about the Beatles than people writing books and people who've been hosting, like you hosting shows forever? No, I don't. I don't. I'm a fan, man. I, I mean, as I learn, I'm just loving it. The more I read, you know, I can't read, I can't read every book that comes out. It's insane. I, how long have you read the McCartney lyrics book? Yes, I have. <laughs> and I'm struggling to read it. I mean, I love it. Once I pick it up, I continue to read it, but then I'm like, 
it's always late at night and I'm like falling asleep. Um, but I haven't finished it yet. And I, I want to, I'm like halfway through the first book. Um, it's an easy read. I'll tell you it is an easy read. Yeah. But I'm not going to put it in the bathroom. I mean, yeah, <laughs> it's not what it's too big. First of all. Uh-huh. Um, and second of all, it's, it's a really cool book. So yeah, but, uh, the stories are amazing. Um, and I'm, and I'm looking forward to seeing Paul in a couple of weeks here in Boston. Okay. So you're going to Fenway? Yeah. Yeah. The first night. I'll meet up with you. <laughs> I'm going too. Nice. My favorite place ever to see Paul has been Fenway. So far. is it really? Yeah. I just think the fans there tend to be more respectful. I'm always watching, especially like in the New York area, when Paul's doing a song like my Valentine and people get out of their chairs for a bathroom break. I don't uh, see that in Boston. I think. Really? People, yeah. I would never. I, I didn't notice stories. that the last time. I, you know, I, I didn't notice that. Yeah. I pay attention to these things, but <laughs> and I love going to Fenway in the first place because of how historic it is. And yeah. Got so much on the walls there, hot dog, 10 cents, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. It's I, an amazing, it's an amazing ballpark. Yeah. Um, a couple more things about Beatles Weekly. Do you go deep into the catalog of group and solo? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'll, pl I'll play virtually anything. Um, you know, depending on what's being featured that week. Um, this past week, um, while I played um, Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth, because I was celebrating the release of uh, the George Harrison album. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also played, um, what was the other one? Oh, McCartney 2 was released. Okay. This week in 1980. So, I, for the first time on my show ever, played uh, Temporary Secretary. Cool. Can you believe it took me that long to play it? I've always loved that song. So I played it and I said, well, let me look it up online first before I play it. And the comments on the video are bizarre. Have you read the comments no, on no. that song? Check it out okay. because it's love and hate. I've been through this on many of my shows, you know. There's a lot of fans out there that don't want Paul to have a more modern sound. You know, they want the more traditional Paul. Those are the people that love the Flaming Pies and Chaos and Creation albums, you know. And I understand that because I love those albums too. Yeah. But I also like when Paul experiments and does the DIY stuff. Press to Play is a favorite of mine. Yeah. Having Rain, parts of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's always division amongst fans. So, but that song in particular, uh, you know, what is this piece of junk? Uh -huh. You know that people are just, oh, this is the worst thing that Paul has ever done, and it's embarrassing. And and then there's other people like, this is why he's a genius to come out with something, and and you know, it's got 1980 written all over it. Uh -huh. But wow, it was kind of ahead of its time because. It was only 1980. Right. Right. And we were just coming out of like the, the late seventies. Uh, and we hadn't really got, it was kind of got into the new wave thing in like 78, but then McCartney came up with this electronic sound. And it's right. like, uh, it's bizarre. And some of the lines in there are pretty funny too. Um, yeah. And then after this, you had bands like Kraftwerk coming out. Yeah. So, and it was very similar. Yeah, very similar. So, yeah, so I played Temporary Secretary and then uh, and, and then I even played Ringo's Rock Around the Clock from his album last year from his um, EP. Hey, yeah. Um, yeah. And that's the second time I played that song uh, on the show, but just wanted to give it another spin because it was kind of a feel good thing. And, um, you know, Ringo doesn't pop up in the solo corner all that much. Hmm. Um, so I want to make sure that I get him in there every a couple of weeks and then you know some weeks he'll be in there i'll put him in there twice okay now, it all depends on the week you know well, but the show's well. a lot of fun to do it's a lot of fun to produce um i try to use the best quality songs and recordings that i can uh so that it sounds really good on the radio okay um, we're uh we're not hugely um distributed through terrestrial radio we have 
you know, three or four stations that are on te terrestrial radio, but we're also on a couple of internet sites, uh, including gotradio.com, mm -hmm. which is free for everybody. Um, and and you're, the show you're the program director there, right? Don't you program I, most of the music channels? I program, no, not most of them. I program um, all the classic channels. Okay. So you have the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, even the 90s, um, and then classic rock and the soft rock cafe. And then there's an oldie station, which is like a combo 50s, 60s, 70s. Okay. Um, and then there's a Southern rock that I pro uh, program. It's altogether like 11 or 12 out of what, 35 or so. So um, yeah, it's a lot of fun to be a, still be a program director, you yeah. know, um, without any DJs, except for Beatles Weekly. It's really the only show where you'll get a host. Uh, and we run it like four times during the week on the weekend so people can hear it right um, at different times. But um, yeah, we can put all those links up so folks can check that out. Okay, and we'll do that. And you raised a good point because I listen to internet radio myself. A lot of stations that carry my syndicated show, Every Little Thing, are on internet radio. And so many of them are just music. And there are no DJs. No. So it's nice to have a show like yours where you're hosting it. So, Yeah, it is. It's fun. It's, yeah. it's, it's really um, it's great to be able to share the love. Okay. Before yeah. we do our Fab Five, I just want to share a few memories with you about WZFM because like, yes. I really love being there because it had, for those of my listeners that don't know, at the time it was an adult contemporary format. So, oh. so um, you know, I always, when I look back at that time, I, I, I sometimes think of it as the Lionel Richie channel because it seemed like every single hour it was either a solo Lionel Richie song or a Commodore song that Lionel Richie sang. That was his time, baby. It was. <laughs> You're absolutely right. In adult contemporary radio, it was. Yeah. But, but don't blame me. I, I did not want to program an adult contemporary radio station, Ken. When I got there, it was a rock station. Mm. And that's what I wanted to be involved in. And then six months later, they sold the station. New owners came in, blew it up. It became adult contemporary. And I was programming Melissa Manchester and Lionel Richie. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't very happy about it. Still got that play some Paul. Still got to play, you know, some Beatles. How well I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know how it is how certain songs trigger memories for you. But anytime I hear Stuck on You from Lionel Richie, I think of WZFM. Anytime I hear Arthur's theme from Christopher Cross, oh, I think boy. of WZFM. And it was wow. the perfect music, even though I love rock too. I love, I love all formats of radio. But to hear that kind of music, in that environment in Westchester, it's suddenly it's it's early morning. You got coffee, the smell of coffee and pastries and stuff like that. And you're hearing all this soothing music. It just really fit. And uh, now I had a blast, you know. And I I remember playing No More Lonely Nights on the on the chat. Yeah. They say say and did we edit out the guitar solo at the end? Or no? I don't think we did. Because that was one of the things that we would have to occasionally do if the guitar solo got a little too loud. Huh. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think you're right. I don't think we edited that one out. Yeah. Okay. So you didn't mind working overnights? Oh, that I wasn't crazy about, but I loved the music. You know, and later on, when I worked in New York City as a producer for the ABC Radio Networks for 10 years, I worked overnights. Oh, and wow. I liked the work, but I hated the hours. Yeah. So um, it, it's it really screws up your whole body system. It does. <laughs> those hours. The whole, and now it doesn't happen very much because now radio stations just voice track overnights. Right. If they have a jock on at all. Right. And for those who don't know what voice tracking is, it's when you record your talk parts hours ahead of time mm -hmm. and plug them into the system. And then the system plays it back as if you're actually there. Right. A blessing and a curse. And just so everyone knows, the radio station has gone through a lot of changes over the years, a lot of format changes, a lot of ownership changes. Yep. And for quite a while, almost 20 years now, they've been the peak. Love uh, the station. Love it. It's great. And uh, Jimmy Fink, who used to yep. be WPLJ, is on there. And Love Jimmy. Uh, Bruce Figler, 
who I believe helped me get my job with you <laughs> at WZFM. The big man is still there? I'm pretty sure he is. I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow. Hi, Bruce. It's a, it's a really great rock station. It's triple A. It is. Which um, stands for, I always screw this up, album, alternative, adult. It's those three words. But it's basically the new rock with right. some classic rock that has all the hallmarks of 60s and 70s music, very melodic, um, not too loud, you know, not super edgy stuff, but really good pop music of today. All Rock. the only thing missing is a Beatles show. Hmm. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jimmy Fink's there. And if there's going to be a Beatles show, it's probably going to be him doing it. You're absolutely right. I remember, you know, the, one of the first times I actually saw Jimmy in person was at the Beatle Fest back in New York. Right. Um, I, I don't know if it was the first one or it was certainly one of the first few uh, held in, in Manhattan. I remember. I remember Jimmy there for a few years. Yeah. See, Those were a blast. But that's one of the problems that people like ourselves have is that you try to get your show on radio stations and almost every radio station has their Beatle person there. So if you try to get your show on, there's one DJ that says, oh, if you're going to have a Beatle show, it's got to be me. Well, go ahead. Do it. <laughs> do it. and Do it better than me. I dare you. Right? Right. Uh huh. And they don't know me. They don't know the work I've done. So no. No, but you can send them, you know, what, what, what we do as radio hosts is we send demos of shows right. to program directors and owners to let them know, here's what it would sound like if you took the show. Right. So they can actually hear what we do. It's their choice whether or not to, to run it. And uh, because of the demographic, demographics of the Beatles audience, mm -hmm. they don't want to do it anymore. They think the audience is too old. Go to TikTok. You're wrong. Well, don't get me started. Don't get me started with this. <laughs> Billy Crystal would say. That's anyway, right. so let's do our Fab Five show. This is all right. I'm now doing. tell tell me again what this is all about. I got to pick one album. You pick one Beatles album, and you yeah. pick one solo album from each Beatle that are the albums that you listen to today the most. Right. And they don't have to be your favorite or what you consider the best. If for some reason you, you're in the mood for wildlife, okay, tell me why it is. You know, it could be any album that you want. It would be the Aminals in the zoo, actually. Aminals. <laughs> the Aminals. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start. I like to shuffle it all up. We're going to start with George Harrison. Well, I, my go-to George is Cloud Nine. Um, you know, while I love the uh, All Things Must Pass was probably that close to, to being selected by me because that's one that I could put on and just listen to all the time. But <laughs> recently, um, recently it's been Cloud Nine. I, you know, the stuff that, Big Jeff Lynn fan here. Uh -huh. Save the Beatles on anthology. Big Jeff Lynn fan. Um, I can't. I, I would just put that CD on and just listen to it. I absolutely love it. Obviously, the big smash was got my mind set. But, you know, this is love. When we was fab. Come on. Mm -hmm. Could that be the greatest George Harrison post Beatles song? There's a lot I like more than <laughs> he's poking fun at the Beatles I know. while also embracing love. Right. And and, you know, here I go. I'm going to go back to um, to Jeff Lynn again. Look at what he did with that album. Mm -hmm. Some people aren't fans. I know that. And 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 we're kind of um, disappointed that that Jeff made the Beatles sound like ELO. But what are you going to do? I mean, Jeff is Jeff. He, he brought it to Tom Petty. They had a huge, a huge partnership and had big hits. Right. He did it with Roy Orbison. He did it with the Beatles. And um, he's got a shtick and it works. So, yeah, um, Devil's Radio and, and, and Got My Mind. And so I keep going back to that one. I, you know, the songs are fun. The, the mood is good. The production is incredible. Um, 
and George is really cool too. And, and the relationship with, with George and Jeff and his son, Danny, mm -hmm. uh, continued, you know, afterwards when they worked on Brainwashed. And I think wasn't Cloud9 George's last album while he was alive? Yes. Yeah. Album, yeah. Um, because not the other one, Traveling Wilburys. Uh, yeah, that's true. Traveling Wilburys too. Let's not forget about that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'd, ha I'd have to go with, um, with that. And plus, you know, um, the usual characters were there helping out, right? Ringo, I think, played. Mm -hmm. Gary Cloud Ryan, Nine. John. Um, who else? Keltner. Yep. Tim Keltner on drums. You know, the usual cast of, right. of characters. Some of them. Yeah. Some of them were there. Gary Wright. Yep. No, George always had great musicians on all of his albums. As did Ringo. Yep. As did John. But they all did, really. <laughs> But, Paul? Uh, oh, come on. He just <laughs> didn't have famous people. Right, right, right. Yeah. But he chose great musicians. You're absolutely correct. Yeah. It's funny because on my podcast shows, you'll get people now these days who don't want that, that frown on Jeff Lynn. And they're not crazy about Free as a Bird and Real Love for the work oh. with it. You know, there are people that don't like the production and the sound that he had back then. And for some of them, it's more like a Jeff Lynne record. And it just happens the Beatles are the, are the artist or George Harrison is the artist. And I know that in the case of Brainwashed, George left instructions not to make it as posh was the word. Not yeah. as heavily a Jeff Lynne sound. So it's held back a bit yeah. on Brainwashed. So, you know. We're living at a time right now where people want more simpler production, um, you know, stripped down stuff. I talk about this all the time on my podcast. And so it's like people want press to play without the Hugh Padgham production. Yeah. They, they're, they'd be curious to hear what Cloud9 would sound like without Jeff Lynn. I would love to hear it too. Yeah. yeah, that would be really cool. I just like, you know, what he did with Phil Spector on, on All Things Must Pass. I love the new uh remastering remixing of that hmm. okay i like it somewhat i never had a problem with the original so i neither did i yeah neither do i could listen to both but for some reason there's a clarity on the on the new release that the old didn't have and that's because of the the specter muddiness uh you know the wall wall of sound that he brought to it but uh, george was not a fan hmm. well you know if he had the final say on that album when he was making it so that's true well time you know time passes and you're like uh you know things change a little bit i guess right hmm. yep anyway how about ringo um ringo is always to me is always ringo the ringo album the mm -hmm. 1973 uh masterpiece you know um I can't get enough of that album. Um, huge hits. Oh, of course. I mean, again, you're talking about what you're 16 and uh, photograph. Oh my my and photograph, big hits, and the and the cast of musicians that were there, all of the Beatles on that album, right? Right. Paul Paul helped with Linda on one of the tracks, and and um, John wrote on the greatest. Don't you love the the version of John singing I'm the greatest. Mm -hmm. That's a riot. We put that on the show once in a while uh -huh. on the Beatles weekly show. Um, yeah. And, and I just like the feel of that album. How do you not listen to it and not feel good? I know it's consistently strong all the way through Richard Perry proved to be a great producer for him. And like we just said, he was surrounded by great musicians and not just the other Beatles, Billy Preston, Klaus Foreman. Yeah. You name it. Jim Keltner, the band. That's right. <laughs> On Sunshine Life for me. Everybody but what, Rick Danko? I think. I don't know. I think he's I, up there. I think, I think the whole band is on Sunshine Life for me. I thought one of them was missing. All right. Prove me wrong. We'll double check. www. <laughs> <laughs> the Beatles, the band.com. <laughs> I don't know. And still to this but, day, you and me, babe, is one of the greatest album closers ever. It is pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Still wish yeah. Ringo would close one of his concerts with that, you know? 
his way of saying goodbye. You know? That would be nice, but that that, that is probably not going to happen anytime in the near future. I don't think so. No, it's got to be what yellow submarine that he ends with. No, he always ends with with a little help from my friends. Oh, with a little help. And then he does the chorus of "Give Peace a Chance." That's right. It's been a while since I've seen Ringo. It's been a few years. And he always does jumping jacks too at the end of the show. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a big hit for Ringo. Like I said, a lot of hits. Um, and and the only reason the album didn't hit number one is because Elton John's Goodbye, Goodbye Yellow Brick, Brick Road okay. was number one, and that held it out. I mean, if you're going to be held out by an album, that's a pretty good one to be, you know? You know, I have no problem with that. No. <laughs> one of my favorite albums. But I'm, I'm sure Ringo's happy with the chart success of that LP. Oh, sure. Yeah. All right. All right. Where do we go now? Sandwich in the middle. Pick your Beatles album. Pick my Beatles album. Yeah. Well. Hint, hint. I'm not sure that I want to walk across that road with you, Ken. Yeah. It it's be Abbey Road. <laughs> it's Abbey Road. Um, recently, with the um, with the box sets that have come out. And I'm a big fan of 5-1 surround sound. Okay. So I always get the big box sets, and you can probably see some of them in the back there. Mm -hmm. You know, a Sergeant Pepper. And, I, and the Let It Be one that recently came out is fantastic. But for some reason, Abbey Road, when I put that, and that's what I've been listening to more lately is because of the surround sound system. It sounds incredible. Um. I'm a big sound guy, so I love the sound quality of it, the production of it, but the songs too. I mean, we found, you know, finally breaking out of his shell, I think George Harrison came front and center and said, hey, we may be breaking up, but I'm going places. Hmm. Uh, and, and he gave us two amazing songs. In fact, um, it, Here Comes the Sun, I believe, is the most streamed Beatles song. It is right now. It has been for years. Yeah. So who go figure. Well, that's also because I think it fits a lot of themes. <laughs> you know, it's a great morning song. Yeah. You know, a weather song. Yeah. Positive yeah. song. You know, it's a lot of different things. But obviously it is a great song. And yes, a lot of people have said that George's two songs could be the two best on the album. But he was always giving us great songs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, he was. But for some reason, those two were just like out in the stratosphere. It was like, you know, even Sinatra said, I love that Lennon McCartney song, something. Right. Um, and yeah. sorry, Frank. Mm -hmm. Wrong. Um, that's an amazing song. That's one of the greatest love songs ever written. Um, it's not yesterday. It's a totally different animal, right? Yeah, yeah, but it's it's one of the greatest love songs ever, without a doubt. Yeah, it is. And then, um, you know, on top of all that, the production is fantastic. And look at what they did with the medley on side two. Those two, Ooh. actually, two medleys. Um, how do you get better than that? I, what do you think about the medleys? Are they like? I don't think you have a more perfect album side than side two of Abbey Road. Yeah. But the thing about the Beatles is that so much of what they did that was miraculous was not planned. I mean, those songs were individual songs, although, you know, Golden Slumbers and Carry That Weight was supposed to be together. Even though you watch the Get Back documentary and Paul's just working on Carry That Weight alone. Yeah. But you, you study the box set and you, you discover that they recorded two songs together at a time. You know, but yeah, yeah. in the very beginning, they're just individual songs. How do you know they're going to flow like that? But they do. There was some magic involved there. Of course, they took out Her Majesty. Yeah. Originally in there. Well, it's a good thing because it really would have been a buzzkill, wouldn't it? Yeah. It just, as much as I liked hearing and, and it made sense with that last note, the way it clicked in there, uh -huh. um, it just kind of blew it all up right in the middle of the medley right no that didn't oh. work and and then to just stick it at the very end of the of the reel and have one of the engineers 
hear it and say, what are we going to do with this? Right. You know, they weren't thinking, oh, we're going to save that and put it at the end. But Paul in particular liked it when he heard it. She said, leave it in there. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, what can you say about side two of those, those medleys? You I think, you, you think maybe though that they could have added the extra note uh, on Her Majesty? Why couldn't he just put that extra note in there? I don't know. I'm so used to it the way it is. What's wrong with it ending like that abruptly? Uh, I want the note. I want the note. I've heard the note. Yeah. The note's good. It's there somewhere. Pop it on the end there. <laughs> just like put all those songs together. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I mean, the medley is is absolutely incredible. And then, you know, the carry that weight in the end thing is just the, the golden slumbers. And it's a perfect way for Paul to end his shows. Uh, and a perfect way for Abbey Road to end too. It's uh, yeah. I can't get enough of the album. It's tough to pick one album, but that, like you said, it's it may be my favorite this week. We say that all the time. You right. Take, you change. You know, talk to me a year from now, and maybe it'll be a different album. But that's the beauty of all this stuff: is that the music is so strong that at any given time, something something can affect you more than it did before in the past. And you can have a whole new appreciation for a certain album that you didn't have before, or you didn't feel as strongly about. And when you've got so much music to pick from, you know, there's, a, there's yeah. a lot of music there that people didn't appreciate that they're getting around to now. So. Well, yeah. And, and like from the documentary, from the get back documentary now, will you ever hear get back the same way again? <laughs> You know, it's like, wow, it's just, he was just doing this on his bass, man. He wrote a song on the bass guitar. Yeah, he was playing it like chords. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That was... George Harrison is standing next to him yawning. <laughs> yeah, here's another one from Paul. <laughs> uh, I wonder what John will think. All right, so uh, why not pick Paul next? Okay, um, this is a tough one because I, I was recently, I've been listening to Tug of War because it also celebrated an anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, is it 40th? 40th. I think 40th anniversary. So I was listening to that a lot about three or four weeks ago. And what an album that was, but I'm not going to choose that one. Because I go back to McCartney one time and time again. And I go back to that album again recently because that was the number one album. I don't know if it was this week, but it might have been last week or the week before in 1970. So 52 years ago, that was the number one album. And um, the Beatles had just broken up. I'm sure they weren't happy about the fact that a solo Beatle had the number one album in America. Um, Paul probably was because of all the, the bad vibes that were going on with Alan Klein and all that. Mm. Um, but what a collection of songs from a from a guy who recorded in his little home studio. It's right, kind of right. like kind of like the pandemic, you know, mm. except fewer tracks available. What did he have? Eight was it eight tracks at the time? Or was it still four? Record into was four track. Four track. Yeah, four track studio. That's insane. But he did finish the album at Abbey Road, I think. Yeah. Because uh, like maybe I'm amazed was not done at home. That was done in a professional studio, and I think Man Who Was Lonely as well. So, but most of the album was started. Yeah, you know, most of it was yeah. done at home, at his home in Scotland. But you know, there's always that argument of McCartney has written all these half finished songs. You know. Yeah. Why couldn't you put more effort behind it and really complete them? And the same argument is made very often with medleys, like on side two right. of Abbey Road. You know, a lot of those songs by themselves may not be complete enough for some people. But no. I've always said the only thing that matters is the end result. And right. really worked on Abbey Road. And some people might look at the first McCartney album as songs that were very fragmented. You know, is there much of a song to that? That would be something, for example. No, but it's a catchy little ditty, isn't it? 
Yeah. It's it's kind of like old rain mama. It's just such a cool song. I love it. Mm. Um, and, and, and Teddy boy, which of course was, you know, bandied about during the Beatles sessions. Uh-huh. Um, so that was, that was always fun uh, to hear. And, and maybe I'm amazed, maybe the, maybe the greatest post Beatles song that he's written. I don't know. On any given day, it could be. A lot of people rated as such. Very yeah. Fun for me. You know, because there's so many great ones. Yeah, and they and they, you know, a radio happens to fall back on the live version because of the Wings Over America album. You know, uh, I hear the studio one just as much, if not more, now today. Do you really? Yeah, I don't. I never hear it. Who's playing it? W E H M on Long Island. Okay. I listen to them a lot. Um. Yeah, WLNG on Long Island. I listen to Long Island stations a lot. So basically, Long Island is playing. <laughs> <laughs> They're not Island. Island. Yeah. out yeah. on the island. Yeah. <laughs> I went to college on the island, so I know, and so did you. Uh huh. All right, so then we got one left, right? We got John. We got John Lennon. Go to album. Oh, boy. You know, this was another. T- this was another tough one because I- I'm going back to what I've been listening to lately and it's double fantasy. And now I'm not just talking about lately. I'm talking about like in the past year, Hmm. that's probably the only John Lennon album that I've listened to all the way through, you know, bits and pieces of others and whatnot. But, um, you mean throughout uh, your whole life, you didn't listen to a a John Lennon album all the way through? No, 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 no. I'm talking about recently. Oh, okay. No, no, no. I'm just talking about recently because that's what, you know, this exercise is all about like what I'm listening to now right? by each of the Beatles. So, so double fantasy is my answer. And the reason is, here's the reason behind it. After reading our friend Kenneth Womack's book hmm. on John Lennon, 1980, I forget the subtitle. Um, the, his the last year in the life, the, la- last, the last, the last year of his life, whatever it was, fantastic book. <laughs> I recommend it to everybody. Uh-huh. Um, it's basically John's last year and everything that went into writing and producing um, this album, the Double Fantasy album, how he wrote the songs in Bermuda. But to me, what, and I, as I listen to the album, and you can hear the surf sounds on some of the songs, right? Beautiful Boy or whatnot. Right. Um, When I hear the story of John Lennon at the helm of the boat, steering this boat through this incredible storm that could have killed everybody on board. How many of them were there? Four of them? Five of them? Just a few. Three or four or five of the people on a boat. All right, John, you go up there and steer the boat to safety. What? And he did it. And that's a movie, Ken. That is sure there a will movie. Be one. What? I'm sure there will be one on that. Well, that needs to be story. because nobody knows about that story. Read the book. Love it. Uh, but that that's what made me re-love that album again. Reading that book. So then <laughs> you sit down and you listen to Starting Over and you sit down and you listen to A Beautiful Boy and, and, and all the great songs on that album. And you're like, wow, this is um, this is a guy who was baking bread and and raising his son for the past, what, five years, years. and was out of the spotlight. The, 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 the last weekend was over mm-hmm. and, um, and he was a good dad and, and took the family to Bermuda and said, you know what, let's give it another go. And Yoko was behind him. Um, and look at what he gave us. His swan song was incredible. It was everything we hoped it could be. He was out there in the press. He was working it. He was selling records. Um, He was a little bit of a different John. Yep. You know, than than, than we had been used to. Mm -hmm. And certainly, it's certainly sad, you know, to think about the fact that he's dead now more than he was alive. I know. More years. So the impact that this man had in those 40 years, including that last one, 
mm. to me um has me has me on that album yeah i i um i love it and and aside i'm also a big cheap trick fan so knowing that cheap trick worked on i'm losing you right with john is is a bonus to have that available as a a bonus track here or there i forget where it is oh it's on the john lennon anthology box set the, the anthology okay yeah uh and i actually played that on my show a couple of weeks ago too it's just a, a kick butt rock and roll song great riff uh really good stuff so that's my john lennon album that's cool. I'm glad to see the love that you gave to Double Fantasy because usually these days a lot of people they always point to Plastic Ono Band and Imagine. Yeah. Um, to see that in the podcast shows that I do, a lot more respect is given to Mind Games and Walls and Bridges, which makes me very happy. Yeah. Um, but I don't hear enough about Double Fantasy, and I do think certainly in the case of, I think Woman is one of the greatest songs ever written. It's probably my favorite Lennon solo song. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, it's a beautiful. It's a beautiful track. It's a gorgeous tune. And I think watching the wheels is one of the greatest songs. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. And wow. What a truthful song that is. Try to write the last five years of your life in a three, three and a half minute pop song and explain where you are at that moment in your head yeah. you know, and how you feel about your life and your career. And he did it so economically, <laughs> you know, in three and a half minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And it was his, you know, last album. Well, I mean, there were more after that, but right. basically, I mean, he didn't have a lot of solo albums. Um, I know it's it's um it's a joy to listen to Double Fantasy, and it's also a lot of pain knowing what happened. You know, yeah, from the yeah. murder, but also to not know what we would have had. And he was really very prolific at that moment. He was churning out a lot of material. Granted, a lot of these songs he'd been working on for a few years. Yeah. Uh, before he finished them, but still, he kept on writing and writing, and they were going to tour. You don't know how much his music was going to change. Um, I remember some of the reviews at the time thought that Yoko stuff was more interesting because it was far more contemporary sounding at the moment, whereas John felt like this is where he left off. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. five six years ago, it's not much different than what John was doing before. But you don't know what path John would have taken musically. No, we don't. No. But anyway, uh, so this has been great spending time with you here, JC. And yeah. I'm going to provide links here in the description box if people want to know more about, well, there's Beatles Weekly and there's Got Radio. And anything more you want to share with, with my uh, viewers? Um, we'll, we'll put all the stuff down below. Um, keep listening to Ken. Keep watching Ken. He's awesome. Uh, <laughs> and give Beatles Weekly a spin. That'll be fun too. And, um, you know, thanks to you, Ken, for having me on. It's been a blast. And uh, you got to do it again. Let's get some more WZFM people on. <laughs> yeah, let's see if I can find one of my bumper stickers. Okay. Thank you so much for doing this. Thanks to all well, of you for watching. And uh, we'll catch you all later. Take care. Love. <laughs>